back to the channel. Welcome back Explorers. My name's Jack. You join me here today as we're looking at the absolute insanity of Group B Rally. I know of Group B. I'm British. I grew up watching Rally. And there was always talks during the 90s of how Group B was always the greatest. I've done a video on Group B Rally, but it was from about five or six years ago now. And I'm just intrigued to see what Slap Shoes can bring to the table because he does brilliant informative videos anyway. And in my last video I did on Group B, people would just complain at me for having personality. So this one, I'm going to stand completely still and not to... No, I'm joking. <laughs> but if you are new around here and you like what you see and you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets YouTube know I'm doing something you enjoy. You have no idea how helpful a little like is to a little channel such as my own. And if you're old around here, welcome back explorers. Let me know if you grew up watching the Group B era. Let me know if you've never seen it before and what you thought of this video. Let me know who your favourite rally driver of all time is as well. Oh, mine will probably either be McRae or Sebastian Loeb. Because that's what I grew up watching. And without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? When auto racing first began in the 1890s, it was extremely simple. Get a bunch of cars and drivers together and have them race from one town to another. First one there wins. In a time before purpose-built racetracks or electronic timing and scoring existed, this was the easiest way to put on a race and have an undisputed winner. However, Whoever these events were held on public roads, and thus you couldn't sell tickets and anyone could just waltz up and watch a race for free, or at least a segment of it. People yeah. wanted to watch the entire race and were willing to pay to make that happen, so around the turn of the 20th century, auto racing migrated onto horse racing tracks, as there were already hundreds of them dotted across Europe and North America. Fans could watch the entire race, get food and drinks, and even bet on the outcome. And the best part was, Look all the infrastructure was already built. In a span of less than 10 years, motorsports went from <laughs> almost unrecognizable to looking exactly like a modern racing event today. But no matter how much Incredible. the sport of auto racing changes or how much different it looks as the decades drag on, some people are always going to want to do things the old way. Even to this day, there are still racing divisions that host races on those same horse tracks from the 1900s. Like I just said, even growing up in the 90s, the talk of the 80s, the old way of rally, the, the, the golden era, the, the golden days of rally, so it does get spoken Some about. Some people who insist on racing in the old styles are just in it for the nostalgia. Others are purists and say that's the only real form of racing. But most see it as an old art form that deserves to be preserved and continued at all costs. Thus, some drivers still held on to the point-to-point -point style of racing that had started at all. In 1911, the Rally of Monte Carlo was held in Monaco and the name stuck. That style of racing forever thereafter was known as rally racing. Eventually, yeah, instead of one-day point-to-point races, the long rallies were broken up into segments run across multiple days. That way, fans could watch more racing and get more bang for their buck. After World War II, motor racing saw an insane boom in popularity all over the world. By 1950, Formula One had begun competition. Because and people needed something to do. Up. But in 1973, the FIA, the sanctioning body for F1, threw their hat into the rally ring and created the World Rally Championship, or WRC. Immediately, they saw success as they gained the rights to the Rally of Monte Carlo and many other major rally races all over Europe, be it in the paved streets of Monaco, the snows of Finland, or the mud of Sicily. Ooh, the WRC did it all and had everything. one of the most challenging yeah. schedules on the planet. Soon, rally racing was becoming more popular than Formula One, because unlike in that series, all the cars in the WRC were stock cars anybody could buy straight from the dealer's lot. The WRC had a rule that in order- Uh, I uh, uh, it's gonna tell you. I was gonna say, I remember like, with Formula One, it had to be a certain amount of models, or as with rally driving, it was like, it, as long as you'd sold 5,000, you could have a rally version of a car. In order to race a car in their series, a manufacturer had to produce at least 5,000 units for commercial and private sales. This rule made the Lancia Stratos one of the most recognizable race cars ever Ooh, made. The Stratos. And it won the WRC's championship Woo. top division three years in a row, from 1974 through 1976. That and the Even in America and other places mm. where the WRC didn't race yet, people knew about the Stratos. Kids had posters of it on their walls. Those lines are unmistakable. Just look at that thing. <laughs> However, by the time the early 80s rolled around, there was a problem with the WRC. The numbers of divisions or groups they ran were too specialized and too restrictive for the automakers to justify manufacturing 5,000 units necessary to meet the WRC's regulations. Also, the six groups they had hamstrung so they dropped it to like 500. Rules. So in 1982, the head of the FIA, Jean Balestra, made a radical move. 
He condensed down the number of groups from six to three. Two stock divisions would remain, but the third was something entirely new. Usually when a sanctioning body is trying to win over teams and factories, they introduce new rules to cap costs and keep them happy. But this time, the FIA would take away the rules and say anything goes. Do what you as want. As long as the car has four wheels and the engine breathes air, you can run it. For the 1982 season, the FIA and the WRC effectively threw the rule book out of the window and said, let her rip. Ah! Goosebumps, hard nips, what more do you want? Oh my god. Woo! 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 Group B, as it came to be known, was pretty much the wild west of auto racing, only really matched by the insane northeastern supermodified scene back in the United States. Oh my Instead word. of 5,000 units in I've never even seen those. Years, it was lowered down to 200, and if you change something on your 200. one year to the next, you only needed to make 20 more, a laughably low limit. There were no restrictions on horsepower, turbo, and superchargers were given the go-ahead, and you could run any engine you wanted, and even the dimensions of the cars oh were not God. mandated meaning that you could watch a rear-engine Porsche 959 compete directly against a front-engine Soviet-built Lada. Yeah, the commie car. <laughs> Group B was... Hey, 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 say what you want about the Lada. They are rally-driving demons. <laughs> Even to this day, go on YouTube, type in rally-driving Croatia. Someone will have a Lada, and it will be hauling ass around the track. Completely insane, and I love it. And the manufacturers put their money where their mouth was by putting forth some of the most monstrous cars to ever grace a race course. They started throwing money at their Group B programs. Yeah, but and then, then their cheating started. Wild. Lancia were here to take their crown back yet again with their Rally 037, the spiritual successor to the Stratos. It had a two-liter rear-mounted four-cylinder engine that produced <laughs> 265 horsepower. That doesn't sound like much. In a rally but car. The rules being a 960 kilogram minimum vehicle weight, about 2,100 pounds. That meant the 037 could absolutely fly through the streets. Oh Launch my lord. The title in 1983, and they had yet another classic car to their name. The 037 and the Martini colors would become as iconic as any race car could ever hope to be. But their main rival in the 1980s was unquestionably Audi, and their the Quattro TT. Cars. The fact that the word Quattro rung a bell for you tells you how influential this series was in its heyday. Audi yeah. had won the title in 1982 with a nifty idea, four-wheel drive. The car was a front engine design and looked fairly normal, but it had a turbocharged inline five cylinder motor. Oh and my four -wheel god! Drive meant that all four wheels could put down to 340 horsepower. It <laughs> that was significantly over the minimum weight, being just a touch under 2,500 pounds. But that much power combined with a way to actually get it on the ground effectively meant that Lancia had serious competition. Four wheel drive for Rally it was largely seen as a novelty before Group B, as it was just and too it went unreliable like shit off a shovel. Easily. But Audi had apparently found the secret sauce and changed the game forever. They also started an arms race by constantly updating the Quattro. They started uh. off with the Quattro A1 in 1983, but next they debuted the Sport Quattro S1. This was a big step up in two ways. First, it produced 100 more oh horsepower than the that's A1, incredible. despite using basically the same engine layout. And second, it really delved deep into the ever-evolving world of... Look at the trends. lines! Aero had been something that... Just look at the lines in cars. And this is the thing that I'm kind of sad about cars nowadays. Every car has the same bubble body. Or... I know it's all aerodynamics and whatnot, la la la. And every car nowadays is either black, blue, grey or white. Where is the joy in life in cars anymore? ...that race teams all over the world had been fiddling with since the 1950s. But cars at the time simply did not go fast enough to make it worth spending that kind of money on R&D. But Group B pushed the envelope so much in the power department that Aero was now a real concern. And the cars began looking less like street cars and more like rocket ships. Yeah, and Joe was also in the off. thick of it with their offering. The 205 T16. It had an inline four turbocharged engine that made an excess of 500 horsepower. and had Aero scoops jutting out of every corner of the car. And despite it having that big front engine compartment, that's not actually where the engine is. Small wheel it's bases. in the middle for better weight distribution. Because this is Group B and you can just do that sort of thing. They mm -hmm. won the manufacturer's title in 1985 and 1986 with Timo Salonen at the helm. Now's where we get to talk about the absolute mad lads and lasses that drove these <laughs> things. Because they were every bit as weird as their cars. Timo yeah. Salonen was a Finnish driver who, despite his appearance making him look like a tax accountant, was the best driver in Group B's history. 
winning more events than anyone else. He was a laid-back yeah, man who never lost his tool. Fire in his feet. driving the car with just one hand and the other one being permanently left on the shifter. Stig Bloomquist took up driving duties for Stig. Audi and tamed their Quattro series, being instrumental. Oh my God! There were so many drivers of the eighties. Won the title for Lancia in 1983, and of course we have to mention the queen uh. of the hill, Michelle Mouton. She is arguably the greatest female race car driver that has ever lived. She set the Pikes Peak Hill Climb record in 1985, won the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and to what? this day she is the only woman who ever was... won a WRC event. And there I knew she was incredible, but I never knew she had that. The fastest cars ever built for rally racing mixed with the best drivers in the world. The FIA wanted to give the WRC a shot in the arm, and they had done it. By 1984, Mad. the WRC was more popular than Formula One, and fans flocked to these events in the hundreds of thousands. Sometimes as many as 400,000 people would buy tickets to see these cars and drivers in action. There were very few, if any, crowd control yeah, measures get in out place the for way. events, and those 400,000 people got to go somewhere. So yeah. people would crowd the racing lines and even stand on the track itself just waiting to get the perfect vantage point to see these race cars do their thing. Some of these videos are just jaw-dropping. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's not like for the me. automotive equivalent of the running of the bulls. I don't even know how the drivers or their co-drivers <sighs> managed to see the road ahead of them. Mechanics and crew reported that after a segment had been completed, they would find bits of clothing and hair stuck in the grill and wings of their cars, body panels splattered with blood, and even fingers wedged into the air ducts. Group B was absolute mania. The coolest race cars, the best drivers, the most rabid fans on Earth, everything that worked my out the WRC and the FIA beyond their wildest imaginations. What could possibly go wrong? Mad. By 1985, these cars were so fast and there were so few rules in place for safety that even the drivers were starting to voice concerns. Another rule in Group B, or really lack thereof, was that cars could be made of any material, including aluminum. Those Audis and Lancia oh, wow. weighed scarcely more than I a metric about ton that. were able to do so because of their aluminum frames and roll cages. No safety. The thing about aluminum, it likes to bend. If yeah. you've ever been on a commercial flight yeah. with a window seat above the wings, you know how much aluminum can flex during flight. That's a good thing for a plane, but not so much for a car. Rescue not workers were also not numerous enough to do anything in case a car went off the track. It could take half an hour for them to show up on the scene, and their communications were also horrendously lacking. Oftentimes, the only way they found out that a driver had wrecked was when another driver drove past, finished their segment, got out of the and car, said, and reported the crashed. smoke they yeah. had seen to an oh. official. By the time medics and firefighters arrived, it was often far too late. Not to mention the hundreds of thousands of spectators crowding the roads made it hard to get to the scene even if their communication was better. On May 2nd, 1985, at the Corsica Rally, a Lancia 037, piloted uh, by Tilo Bottega, yeah. went off and slammed into a tree. His co-driver was okay, but when medics arrived 20 minutes later, they found the co-driver Mauricio limping out of the woods and Bottega dead still inside of the car. The drivers petitioned the FIA to do something, but they determined that at the speed the car was going, nothing would have prevented Attilo's death. It was more or less hand-waved away as a freak accident. Racing is inherently dangerous, that's true, but the FIA's yeah, investigation but... left drivers with little peace of mind. But later in the year during the Argentinian rally, Ari Vatanen crashed in a scary rollover. He broke both legs and a few ribs, one of which punctured his lung. He and his co-driver survived, but they both vowed to never race in Group B again. Rally crashes, the man. They make so the hairs in my body so much stand power up. that one driver said the cars moved faster than he could react. It was more or less driving and that the saves something. right on the razor's edge of what was humanly possible. So, going into 1986, the FIA finally budged and outlawed aluminum roll cages and set limits on aero devices like wings and spoilers, in hopes of slowing the cars down. But everything else remained the same, no limits on power and no crowd control measures. Because coming in 1987 was the new Group S division, Group B's replacement. Here there would be virtually no rules. Manufacturers only needed to make 10 road cars to reach oh, the production limit. What? And the automakers were already developing their new round of supercars. In March 1986, the Portugal rally was held, and the country had already become a hotbed for gearheads of all stripes, and now Group B would get their shot at glory in the country. People flooded the streets, and the first incident of the rally occurred when a cameraman was basically pushed into the line of fire, and Timo Salonen damn near ripped the man's hand off with his car and completely destroyed the $3,000 camera. The next accident would not be so lax. Joaquim Santos, a native Portuguese driver, started off in his Ford Don't RS2 stand that close! Wanting to see the hometown guy rip through the streets, people crowded more and more onto the course. 
At one point, a spectator jumped out onto the track and oh, Santos swerved to miss him. I noticed. He then overcorrected and the car slid broadside into a group of people. His co-driver, Miguel Oliveira, said that in yep. Group B, the cars were so fast that he just had to look at his notes and feel the track turn for turn. But in this instance, he suddenly felt thuds and bumps as the car careened into the crowd. 32 people were injured and three people died, including a mother and her 11-year-old son. In a Rest disgusting in move, the FIA continued the race and did not tell the other drivers what had happened. When the drivers completed the segment and got told what happened, what? they banded together and vowed to go on strike to stop the competition. But the FIA kept things going, and Jean Balestra said he would punish any driver or manufacturer that walked out. At the Corsica rally just two Leave. months later in May, Henry Tovenin and his co-driver, Sergio Cresto, were putting on the race of their lives winning stages left and right. But on the second day of competition, their launch went off at a point where there was no guardrail, and it flew off of a steep hill. The fuel tank immediately ruptured, and a ball of fire erupted uh. from the Drivers completing the segment reported to officials that they'd seen black smoke in one of the turns, and by the time rescue personnel got to Henry too and late. Sergio, Way there was nothing late. left of the wreck except a charred frame. Now inaction was borderline criminal, and after international pressure from drivers, manufacturers, and governments, Group B was immediately banned from competition and never got to see the light of day again, and its successor, Group S, was scrapped entirely. After Group B's disbanding, Group A, the more strictly stock division, picked up the banner and marched forward. But this time with the restrictions and safeguards the drivers of the 80s had wanted. That now was basically a power slide. Further back in most areas, and rescue personnel were more numerous with helicopters in the air and radio communications opened up between them. Now if a driver went off, their officials would know about it immediately and be able to send help within a few minutes rather than half an hour. Even still, rally racing remained popular all over the world. The Subaru Impreza WRX and the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo became classic cars. Oh and their man! Traction control systems and driver assist are commonplace on road cars today of all makes and models. The features you take for granted in your personal car and the safety precautions in place at every racetrack today were earned out there on the ice, snow, gravel, and dirt stretching from Portugal to Corsica, from Finland to Argentina. People had to pay a high price for those things. And if there's any silver lining to Group B mm -hmm. and rally racing as a whole, it was that they have saved countless lives through these technological advancements. The WRC is still competing today, and the envelope is still being pushed but with the proper safety measures in place to make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes. And even with all the new now, see, that's something I still don't agree with. Night rally courses, especially in the 80s, 90s, and so on. Night rally courses in the snow, photographers would be stood on the corner bends, hairpins or whatever. So the minute you slam that tower out and you get around the corner, all you'd get are pin bulbs flashing like crazy. And it ain't like one or two. There were hundreds of flashes. And it's like, that's so fucking dangerous to the driver. I don't understand why people to this day still do it. I know you're getting a cool shot at night and the cop, but like, are you going to risk killing someone for a photograph? Rules set up, limiting horsepower and boost, and making the cars sturdier with steel. If you watch a modern WRC event, you can see that the true spirit of Group B never completely went away. Oh, edge of hand. Today, the cars have a lot less horsepower, but they're actually faster than their Group B brothers, if you can believe it. And I've got to get around the bend. Fucking ridiculous. There's never been a better time to be a rally fan with cameras broadcasting every angle of every stage. It's true. And yes, you can still get uncomfortably close to the action if that's your thing. No, nah, not for me. European fans watching this, y'all got it pretty good over there. Don't forget that. Anyway, I'm Slap Shoes. Thanks for watching. And until Thank next you, time, Slap. Y'all take it easy. Go and subscribe to Slap Shoes channel. He puts out bangers all the time. The only way I can really describe the ending and the outcome of the Group B rally outcome, really, it all comes down to a bit like the Dow Earnhardt Senior crash. When he had that crash, the whole safety rules of, of NASCAR were looked upon like, we have to really work at this now and make it better for people. And I feel like after the 1980s, when we did Group B, it showed the insanity of what you could do with a vehicle and it's more of the case of just because you can doesn't mean you should i really enjoyed this slap shoes as ever great video let me know what to watch next let me know like i said who your favorite driver was if you made it this far other than that have a great day be well and bye bye